got it. Sorry. Okay, we are now recording. And uh, this is the um, GIS updates in Eagles Wetland program presented by Chad Fizel, who is um, the Wetlands GIS specialist at Eagle. He's been there a while. We've worked with him over the years. And um, over the years, we've seen so many exciting um, developments in the whole GIS world and so many great tools that we as wetland consultants use on a daily basis. So it, we have keen interest in hearing what Chad has to share with us today. So Chad, uh, why don't you take over the screen share and right. uh, start, thank you. Thanks Elise. Go ahead and pull up my slideshow here. And if I could just get a thumbs up when you guys are seeing my slide there. All right, excellent. Well, thank you, Elise, for that uh, introduction. Um, I, I was noticing that that uh, picture that you had there in my bio, I actually happen to be wearing my same Spartan sweater today. So maybe that's, that's good luck. Um, but anyway, yeah, as you said, uh, always some very exciting things going on in the GIS world. Um, We've seen just huge growth from when I started back in the, the caveman era almost 20 years ago um, and, and seeing our staff pull paper maps out of file drawers um, to where we are today. And um, I know many of you are familiar with a lot of our data and, and um, applications, and um, I'm hoping to kind of talk about some new uh, work that we've been uh, going for for the last year or two. Um, and yeah, with that, I'll jump into sort of a brief outline of what I'm planning on covering today. So I'm going to start by talking about our 2015 update to the National Wetland Inventory. Um, we've got some exciting things going on there with all of our new remote sensing in the state. Um, we're now involved um, actively with the National Hydrography Dataset Update um, and working to integrate that with our NWI efforts, um, a project that I'm very, very excited about. Um, I'm going to shine a little bit of a light on uh, the lakes part of our wetlands, lakes, and streams unit. Uh, most of you, I'm sure, are familiar with Eric Calabro and some of the great work he's been doing uh, in our lake management program in, in uh, WLLSU. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of the status and trends work we did up on Lake Charlevoix. Um, and then hopefully with some time at the end, I can go through some of the updates we've done to Wetlands Map Viewer. Um, and show off our new Eagle Open Data Portal where all of our new GIS data that you're seeing today for the most part is available to, to you as members and to the public as a whole. So uh, yeah, hopefully cover some good entertaining stuff for you folks today. So starting with uh, NWI, which is near and dear to my heart. Um, again, I've been working in the program for 20 years and um, NWI has been just sort of an integral part to my job and um, you know, my overall efforts in the program over the years. And um, we've come a long way from this, obviously. So um, some of you that have been around as long as I have may remember the old paper NWI maps and um, trying to make sense out of them. And certainly in our program, trying to, um, you know, use these to evaluate wetland impacts in a regulatory sense, um, certainly wasn't the most effective tool, but um, again, we applaud those, you know, geographers back in the day that started this effort um, because it's led to some really great things in Michigan as the years have gone on. Um, see a lot of thumbs up. So maybe we got some old timers on the call today. Um, so one of the first projects that I worked on uh, back in 2004, 2005 time period was taking our original uh, 1978 NWI data and updating it to some of the new imagery that we had gotten in the state since I'd arrived. So we had a new 1998 statewide uh, aerial imagery data set and a 2005 data set. So our first effort was really to look at this old uh, NWI data and try and update it to something more current. So, you know, looking at that older stuff over the 98, you can see we already lost some wetland to agricultural impacts. Um, and then by 2005, we had lost a pretty severe chunk of that wetland complex to the M6 corridor over by Grand Rapids. Um, so this was basically just a quantitative exercise where we went in and essentially just used GIS to cut out the wetlands that we've lost and do some basic status and trends, um, you know, on what our wetland resources look like in a more current sense. Um, and since then, we've gotten even better imagery 
um, and statewide LIDAR. And that's really set the stage for hopefully that some of the best hydrologic inventories we've ever had in the state. Um, you know, you can see in the example as we've moved from one meter imagery to 12 inch imagery to six inch imagery in the state, um, we're doing a better and better job of quantifying our wetlands and mapping our wetlands and streams and lakes. Um, and the data just keeps getting better as time goes on. Um, I've heard recently we're talking about doing a second LIDAR collection in the state. Um, for those of you not that familiar with LIDAR at this point, I will show some examples of that, but uh, high resolution topography that's generated from that data is sort of changing the game in terms of how we do a lot of this work. So um, looking at the old NWI data set, um, with some of this current imagery, you know, one of the things we've always tried to avoid in the inventory game is over mapping and under mapping. Um, and I think the original NWI probably did a lot of both. Um, and we've attempted to sort of hone in on that with some of this new data. Um, you know, looking at this imagery in color infrared, you can really get a feel for, um, you know, saturation and inundation in a way that we never could on some of that older imagery. And then combining that, with the LIDAR um, really allows us to hone in um, and get some great topographic breaks on these wetland boundaries um, and using the imagery to, to really get down to a class level and a classification level that we've never been able to get to. Um, so in conjunction with the NHD project and doing a, a much better job of mapping our streams and rivers, um, this data is starting to shape up really well um, and we're getting a significant chunk of the state completed at this point. So this is, um, I think, probably out ahead of uh, most of the other states in the country um, in terms of the way that we've uh, pulled together all the different uh, stakeholders in the game of mapping wetlands and hydrology um, for, for the US. And um, we just so happen to not only have NWI funding to, to do some updates, um, but there was also an effort going on at the Center for Shared Solutions to get some funding together to update the streams and rivers, um, which is takes form in the National Hydrography data set. So with those two things going on simultaneously, we really saw an opportunity to bring some of these players together um, on the federal and the state level, um, the private level. We've got USGS and their NHD coordinators working with us um, on a weekly basis looking at um, all this elevation derived data that we're creating. Um, the state of Michigan has been completely involved. MSU has been involved. Um, Ducks Unlimited has been doing our NWI updates for us for the last 15 years um, and is one of my best partners. Um, we've got NV5 doing a lot of work uh, on the NHD updates as well as EPA interested in this effort. So this has really been one of my roles in the last couple of years is just trying to, you know, pull all these relevant brains together that are sort of working towards the same goal, uh, which is mapping our hydrology consistently and effectively and accurately. Um, so very excited about this. I mean, obviously, you know, wetlands and streams, especially in Michigan, are interconnected in the way that they function. And many of the systemic you know, water quality problems that we see in the state with excess sedimentation and nutrient loading and um, all those sorts of problems are, are really caused by historic wetland loss. And we've, we've done a lot of work in quantifying that and, um, you know, looking at the numbers on that over the years. And we've lost 40% of the wetlands that we originally had since pre-settlement. So this NHD NWI effort is really an effort that hopefully will bring these two concepts back together that um, wetlands and streams need to be, you know, considered as one system um, and lakes as well um, and be mapped as such so that they all match up and we have a, a nice clean um, hyd hyd hydrologic inventory for the state moving forward. So I'm certainly not an expert uh, on the specs of NHD. Uh, what I can tell you is they are very, very rigorous. Um, USGS imposes you know, many, many requirements on the vendors that we're using to produce this hydrography data to make sure that the streams, the channels, um, you know, the wetland areas are all defined in a way that match up with this LIDAR DEM in the background here. Um, and as a result of that, we're mapping streams um, and headwater areas in a more accurate way than we ever have. Um, 
we are going to be mapping things essentially down to a, a grassed waterway and an ag field, though some of that will be used more on the state side and not pulled into the overall NHD. So this LIDAR really gives us the ability to map channels that are, are very small and really connect up the hydrography in an accurate way for the first time for the state. So one of the things that we've struggled a bit with is sort of the difference in the mapping techniques and requirements for NWI and NHD. So again, NHD is at this point focused solely on mapping water bodies and streams uh, using LIDAR. So we're talking down to the pixel level you know, they really have to match with these um, elevation DEMs that you're seeing on the right. NWI is still using a standard that requires interpretation from aerial imagery. Um, I guess the exciting thing that's coming out of this is by talking with the USGS folks and the Fish and Wildlife Service folks in charge of these two products, we're starting to see some movement from Fish and Wildlife to move NWI more towards mapping off of LIDAR. Um, so they, I think they've already agreed and they've written some standards for at least for the water bodies um, to start to use some of these EDH standards so that the, the mapping specs between the two products are, are matching. Um, we've had DU and, and MSU and some other vendors sharing the water body data back and forth um, between them, which is, you know, resulted in efficiency for the NHD project. Um, you know, NWI haven't gone in and mapped all these water bodies already um, certainly saved a lot of time and effort on the NHD side. And um, it's it's been a great partnership so far. And, you know, I think in the next three to four years when both these projects are complete, we're gonna uh, see just a really quality product come out of both. So just to kind of give a visual example of, you know, where we are now, uh, but where, you know, really we're heading into the future. You know, this, again, the LIDAR stuff blows me away. Um, it, it's an amazing product and um, going back to those one meter images that we started with and looking at this just still blows my mind. Um, but we didn't really have this uh, when NWI and NHD were originally mapped. So looking at, you know, the 1978 NWI overlaid on this topographic landscape, you can see there's a lot of stuff we've probably missed. Um, there's obviously things that we've overmapped, probably a hill slope here or there. Um, you know, we throw on the old NHD and you can see that, yeah, it's kind of in the channel. It's following the general path, but, you know, certainly not locked down to where that channel actually exists. Um, so really what we're shooting for is something that looks more like this. Um, and the minute that you're using that sort of EDH spec and using the LIDAR to, to really lock in your boundaries, you consistently start to get a better product. So, and then ultimately the, the goal of integration of these two efforts is that that stream follows the channel and also matches with the wetlands uh, that are adjacent to it. So this is sort of the, you know, Shangri-La dream of mine that, I, that I'd like to see um, for the state. And, uh, you know, I'm hoping in the next 10, 15 years before I get out of this game that um, we'll have this, you know, completely done for, for the state. Um, you know, one of the other partners we've engaged with now is FEMA. Um, FEMA has gotten involved in our NHD update effort and is now using some of these stream channels that we are generating through NHD as part of their floodplain mapping process. So again, in my mind, all of these data sets should essentially match each other um, and we should be working off the same inventory. Um, so that's that's really where we're headed with this project. Uh, very exciting, like I said, NWI is scheduled to be wrapped up, uh, hopefully for most of the state in the next three to four years. Um, NHD is pretty similar, so um, certainly stay tuned to that. I think uh, you guys will be more impressed with this round of data than uh, than maybe the last. So, yeah, that's what we're shooting for there. So, <clears throat> just to give you a little update on where we are, where we're headed. Uh, we recently completed NWI updates for the Simcog region down in Southeast Michigan. Um, did a full landscape level wetland functional assessment effort on that. Um, we've got essentially the lower, I would say half of the lower peninsula completed for NWI updates. Um, and NHD is down in sort of the Southwest, Southeast part of the state working right now and quickly catching up. 
um, to the northern parts of the state. So, um, you know, we're still looking for funding to finish uh, the northern part of Michigan and the UP, um, but it's looking like through some of these efforts and the attention they're getting, we're, we're going to be hopefully getting some GLRI funding, um, some Fish and Wildlife Service funding to continue moving these efforts and complete the state. Um, so hopefully exciting to all of you as it is to me. Um, certainly the inventories needed some, some updating and some improvement um, and using all these tools and with all these partners, I, I feel really good about where we're, we're going from here. So uh, I wanted to just shine a little bit of light on some of the work we've been starting to do with Inland Lakes. Um, again, Eric Calabro has been in our program for about five years now. And for those of you that know him and have seen his work, he's done some amazing stuff uh, with the 301 uh, Lakes program. And he came to me a year or two ago and um, wanted to talk about doing some shoreline status and trends work, cumulative impact type work around Lake Charlevoix. Um, given some local concerns about the amount of armoring that had been done historically on the shoreline and was continuing to, to present day. Um, so yeah, we sort of put our brains together and um, tried to figure out the best way to go back and analyze this. Um, hopefully some of you catch my little inside joke on the detective there, but to me, this has always been the funnest and the coolest part of my job. Um, you know, is getting to go back and sort of reconstruct what these resources looked like uh, previous to, you know, us sort of uh, nitpicking and impacting them over the last 200 years since, you know, pre-European settlement time. Um, and we really have a lot of GIS resources and very cool resources to use to bring to bear on this type of effort. So um, I just wanted to kind of talk about this briefly, show, show you what we did here. Um, you know, this started years ago, uh, back when Luis Saldivia was still working in Grand Rapids District and um, had a project on Gun Lake that he wanted to do some cumulative impact analysis on. Um, and we had recently obtained all the historic imagery from MSU's aerial archive um, and gotten it digital on our servers. So I thought this might be a great opportunity to go back and look at what Gun Lake looked like in the 1930s and move forward from there. Um, and some of this has been very useful over the years. And, you know, Eric loves to show these slides in his presentations now because there's nothing like pictures to sort of prove a point. Um, and when it comes to this, um, looking at that 1938 shoreline to the north, and then in 2010-ish, um, can't even see my date, 2012 maybe. Um, obviously, we've severely impacted the shorelines of many of our inland lakes. and um, you know, it goes beyond the pale in places where, you know, old wetland complexes are now, you know, uh, look like Caribbean resorts built out into the, the inland lake. So, you know, again, powerful images to kind of get an idea of what we're talking about here, um, trying to assess sort of the cumulative impact of the loss of all that shoreline, the loss of the wetlands adjacent to that lake, um, and what that means for the water quality of the lake in present day. So just a few more examples of, you know, pretty heavy modernization of that shoreline. And as you can see, you know, nature doesn't make straight lines. Uh, obviously a heck of a lot of seawalling done. Um, and as Eric can tell you much better than I, you know, that has huge impacts on habitat and fish and, and all the, um, you know, biota of that lake. So very serious in terms of, uh, you know, the, the health of the lake itself. So back here, we were at this project, we were really just looking at sort of cumulative wetland loss. Um, so we didn't really get in and quantify the type of armoring too much. Um, but again, just with some basic GIS tools, looking at how much of that wetland was originally, uh, I'm sorry, how much of that shoreline was originally wetland. Um, and then overlaying that with what is currently wetland. Um, it was a pretty severe amount of loss overall. Um, I believe they had lost something to the effect of 52% of the wetland shoreline. Um, so again, that causes major ecological impacts to a water body like that. And um, you know, with Eric on board, we're really trying to use that information in a way that's positive and educational 
um, and informative to, to, to people that live on these lakes, um, just to sort of show them the bigger picture. So by the time we got to Lake Charlevoix, um, we have, again, much better remote sensing data to bring to bear um, and some great historical data in terms of what used to be uh, present in that lake. So I can go back to 55 um, for this area and obviously right along the mouth to Lake Michigan there, it was already pretty developed, um, but it certainly hasn't decreased in its uh, amount of development over the years, obviously. Um, so again, we have all this great remote sensing data that really allows me to now get in and see the shoreline so clearly that I can really begin to quantify the types of armoring, the amount of armoring that's happened on this lake over the years, um, and really all the way back to you know the 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, so we have a ton of imagery, ton of different types of Im imagery, leaf on, leaf off. Um, much of this, you know, color infrared helps with identifying wetland areas, like I said. Um, so a lot of tools to bring to bear. Again, the LIDAR is invaluable here. Um, I believe this LIDAR was flown in, uh, I want to say 2018. So really gives us a great place to start in terms of defining where that land water interface was. So that was one of the first things I really needed to do was identify the quote unquote shoreline as best as I could. So using the LIDAR DEM um, and the contour data, I can pretty quickly generate contours down to about one foot. And then the goal became, okay, well, which one of those contours best represents that land water interface? Um, and you can see visually essentially how that looks. So now I have one line that goes all the way around the 35 miles or so of Lake Charlevoix that sort of defines that boundary. So using that now, we can begin to quantify what was there originally and then what's going on in present day. And one of the places we turn is these GLO surveys. Um, we actually have the PDF maps and the data that goes with them. These go back to like the 1820s. Um, and it's really was the original survey of Michigan where they went out and tried to quantify, um, you know, the landscape, including things like wetlands, lakes, and streams. Um, and this data has been used to generate 1800 land cover data sets um, and really is a pretty cool source to tell you what was originally around these resources pre-European settlement. So these are the land cover classes we can sort of generate from that. Um, you can see this area was dominated by cedar swamps, um, huge expanses of cedar swamps, some of which are still there, um, but many of which have been, you know, uh, either drained or built over. Um, so again, one place to start in terms of quantifying the original land cover there. Um, we also have hydric soils data, which again, a little more accurate than the 1800 land cover, obviously. Um, you know, done by NRCS scientists out digging holes in the ground and uh, creating their maps based off on the ground observations uh, can give us a ton of information about where wetlands were historically um, that have been impacted in present day. And then again, um, we've got our NWI. I can use my NWI to identify, you know, wetland boundaries still that uh, meet up with that shoreline. So looking at Lake Charlevoix overall, um, I've cut this bar in my way and I can't even read my own slides. Oh, there we go, that helped, sorry. So just looking at uh, Lake Charlevoix, pre-settlement wetland versus upland numbers. Um, of that total, I'm sorry, 63 miles of shoreline, um, about 37 miles of that was actually wetland frontage along the lake originally, um, compared to about 27 upland. Um, so certainly there's plenty of upland there. Um, but again, looking at how much uh, wetland was there originally, much of this lake was bordered by large forested wetland complex originally is what we can draw from that. Um, so that kind of gives us a starting point in terms of where we go from there. Uh, one second, for some reason I've lost my ability to cycle my slides here. Can you guys hear me still? Yes. 
Okay, sorry. For some reason, my slides have stopped cycling. Just give me one second. I'm going to try and reshare it. Okay, let's see. There we go. Okay, so again, back to where I was. Uh, obviously, again, a heavy dominant amount of wetland shoreline along Lake Charlevoix is sort of the conclusion here. So some of the other things we can do um, now moving into sort of the more current era. Again, we have all that aerial imagery, all the LIDAR data. Um, we also have now a, a pretty decent wealth of permitting locations that we can pull from my Enviro. Um, so, you know, all the permits that have been issued over the years for things like seawalls, riprap, um, you know, all of those types of activities are now contained with a location in my Enviro. Um, and I apologize, I've got it called My Waters here. It recently switched over. Um, but that data was very useful in terms of helping me sort of identify what sorts of uh, things I was seeing on the imagery. Um, so again, I've got two different types of imagery here that I had to, to use to get sort of the most contemporary look at this. Um, the first is our 2017 leaf off imagery. Um, and this was uh, color infrared, so very good for um, identifying the shoreline as well as wetlands adjacent and identifying land cover. Um, Resolution-wise, this stuff is 12 inch and it's really, really high quality. Um, the most recent imagery we had at the time when we did this was 2020. Um, that imagery happens to be leaf on. Um, so not quite as useful, but it does help seasonally to you know, use some summer imagery to see where things like docks, um, beaches, beach sanding are occurring during the summer. Um, so I'm using primarily those two imagery data sets to, to assess the shoreline here. So then the question was, you know, what kinds of shoreline do we have? Um, you know, some are very obvious on aerial imagery, obviously things like riprap, um, you know, stand out. You can actually see the individual rock on much of this imagery. Um, so that was one of the relatively easier things to identify. Um, and then again, I also had my waters data or my Enviro data showing me that there was riprap permitted in this location in 2020. So that obviously helped inform sort of the accuracy of uh, the shoreline classification as I moved around the lake. So there were many of these areas that, um, you know, we're still natural, not armored, um, but developed. So you would see things like, you know, a little bit of beach sand, a dock coming out, um, but not necessarily an armored shoreline, um, non-armored, but still developed. So that was one of the classes that I tried to pull out and separate. Um, obviously, there's still uh, wetland frontage there. Um, so where I felt like, you know, NWI and, and this imagery was indicating wetland adjacent to the lake, I attempted to capture that on the shoreline inventory. Um, again, there's plenty of areas that are natural and upland along the lake there. So broke those off into a separate category. Um, again, just looking at the sheer volume of, you know, the My Waters permit locations that we had, uh, obviously this helped inform sort of the overall accuracy of this. Um, and again, these are still being logged up to the current day. So, um, you know, very useful data for us to go in and do some basic interpretation utilizing this. So this is what we end up with um, at the end is 65 miles-ish of shoreline, um, all classified down to this classification scheme. Um, so I tried to pull out beach sand from boat launch, uh, tried to pull out the jetties and all the way down to sort of natural upland and wetland boundaries. And that allowed me to do, you know, a whole bunch of calculations to compare that back to what the shoreline used to look like um, and give us some idea of cumulative impacts on this lake overall. So yeah, looking at the total 63 miles, um, you can see there's quite a bit of riprap. About 30% of the shoreline is uh, now buried under some form of rock. Um, and obviously big impacts on the ecosystem and the overall biota based on that sort of impact, um, you know, and then plenty of, you know, actual seawall 
Um, still lots of wetland, um, but again, when compared back to a number that looked more like 50% wetland frontage, um, obviously a, a steep reduction in wetland uh, areas adjacent to the lake as well. So when we look at the big picture, um, you know, we've already armored essentially 56% of that lake um, with some kind of hard structure. Um, and again, I'm sure it's not a surprise to most of you on the call that, you know, we're having a serious impact on the ecosystem of Lake Charlevoix with those kinds of numbers. Um, and hopefully that gives us some sort of, you know, educational ammo to uh, start to reduce the amount of new uh, seawall and riprap construction that's going in. Um, so at this point, you know, looking at going from almost 37 miles of wetland shoreline, you still have about 10 miles uh, if you look at that total lake that's uh, adjacent to wetlands. Um, but we do see ongoing impacts in, in those and are still working on cases where some of those wetlands are being impacted. But we've sharply reduced, you know, the ability of those wetlands to keep that lake clean and keep the habitat in, in good standing order um, when you're looking at a 58 to 16 per percentage point drop. Um, so again, that's the sort of thing we're trying to quantify and, and educate on uh, with these types of efforts. So one of the great things about doing all this in GIS is that uh, you know we can continue to update this data and look at ongoing and status and trends now that we have a good baseline. Um, we're expecting good 22 uh, spring leaf off imagery to come in here any day. Um, and that would, again, help me very much in going in and improving that classification um, with some better imagery and, and that leaf off uh, condition. So there's certainly been some efforts to do some on the water surveys uh, from boats, uh, just to go out and do some ground truthing of some of this data. Um, and again, there is future LIDAR coming. So uh, when we have two different sets of LIDAR from two different time periods, um, it's going to make it very easy for us to go in and pull out features like this, um, you know, even very small ones around in the lakes. So, and again, obviously, as my environment moves forward, uh, logging the locations of all our regulatory activities, um, you know, we've got some pretty good data these days uh, to do these types of analyses. So, that is the end of uh, my slideshow. I think I'm doing okay on time here uh, to leave some time for questions at the end. Um, I'll just throw my contact uh, info up for a second. If anybody wants to jot that down, and I am then going to kick over and do some uh, live demo of our GIS applications that you all can access anytime you want. So let me just share. So Chad, do you want to answer a few questions? Um, sure. I sure. saved a I saved a couple for you. Um, yeah. Brian. Yeah. Shoot. Brian asks. Given that streams move, natural systems are so pesky that way, how often will the stream data need to be updated? Would flooding events trigger an update to the data faster than the normal schedule? Yeah, uh, but well, certainly now that, um, you know, we have things like drones that can fly LIDAR um, for emergency things such as, you know, massive floodings, you know, we can go up and, and get data, you know, tomorrow. Um, but yeah, NHD, I think, will be on sort of the rotating schedule that NWI is on. Um, we attempt to update each of those about every 10 years. Um, I mean, the good news is that the two inventory updates that are going on right now are going to be the best baseline we've ever had um, and will facilitate updates better than any of the data we've ever had really has been able to do. Um, so yeah, we're expecting some new LIDAR. Um, coming in hopefully in the next couple of years, that'll, that'll be about 10 years since it was done last time. So um, hopefully we can stay on top of this about every decade, so. Okay, uh, where can we find the 1939 aerial imagery for Michigan? Well, if you're a state of Michigan user, um, it's actually on all of our GIS uh, servers. So from, you know, ArcMap or ArcPro or um, even at times ArcGIS Online, we can make that stuff available. Um, if you're not a state of Michigan user, that data, I believe, is still available through MSU. Um, and in limited cases can, can be provided by the state in, in special circumstances. But, um, you know, usually for a fee, you can get all that data from Michigan State University's 
uh, RS and GIS outfit. Okay, a couple of similar type questions. Is the Eagle open data portal available to the public at no cost to view current LIDAR mapping? So I'm gonna go into that actually in just a second. Uh, we'll okay. talk about the open data portal. Um, the LIDAR data is available to the public typically via USGS. Um, there's a couple different sites that serve that data up. Um, so yes, that data is publicly available. Okay, one more, um, and, and maybe you could just talk about this when you are showing Wetlands Map Viewer, but there was a question about what year are the high-res photos in Wetland Map Viewer from? So if you could talk about that when you're doing your demo, that yep. would be fantastic. I'll answer a couple more. Um, in the in the Q and A, and then uh, uh, we'll see what's left when you're done with your demo. Okay, very good. I think I'm right on time here. Should still have a few minutes left. So, um, again, I'm sure many of you have seen Wetlands Map Viewer evolve over the years. Um, we've recently added a whole bunch of new data to it. Um, some of which we're still troubleshooting and trying to to get functional. Um, but this is still sort of one of the most used applications on uh, Eagle's website. Um, so again, bravo to all of you for, for getting good use out of it. I hope that it's uh, still useful to, to, to you all. So obviously, um, if you're not familiar with this, WMB is essentially our clearinghouse for all of our wetlands GIS data um, and an application where you can go in and actually view it interactively. Um, so all of this is, you know, being utilized from our actual GIS data sets on our servers, which are also, also available to GIS professionals. Um, but for the public and for folks that don't have a good understanding of GIS, um, we've tried to make this as simple as possible um, to essentially go in and find out if, you know, you live in, near, or on a wetland. Um, so, you know, obviously we have just a ton of layers in here. Um, from the hydric soils data that I mentioned, um, which again can help us inform some of our pre-settlement, uh, you know, data questions, uh, to the NWIO5, uh, which is still our latest statewide data set for NWI. Um, we are actively working towards getting the 2015 data that's completed added in here as a separate layer. Um, so look for that hopefully coming this year. Um, Potential wetland restoration areas has um, been a big hit with our, you know, mitigation and restoration specialists, um, giving you some idea of the best areas if you want to actually go in and recreate wetlands uh, that's been lost since pre-settlement times, where would you look to do that? And, um, you know, from what my, my friends and colleagues in the industry tell me, you know, these red areas are pretty sure fire hits for, uh, for restoring wetlands. So. Lots of great data on here beyond just the, the wetland inventories we've discussed. Obviously, our state wetland inventory is uh, on here as well from 2007. Um, and this is essentially just an amalgamation of all our available wetland data at the time. Um, you know, as things move forward, there's no plans to update this, but uh, we'll continue to, to update NWI uh, as the years uh, roll past. So beyond that, uh, we've tried to build in as much stream data as we can. Um, we do have the USGS stream gauges on here and uh, are working to build in some functionality um, where you can actually pull the live feed from those. Um, not quite there yet, but uh, you know, they're there. There's the gauge just upstream of my house, in fact, that I check regularly. Um, so that's a recent addition. Um, our dam inventory is still in here. Obviously trout streams and trout lakes. Um, this will probably be updated in relatively short order as well. Um, and we, now we've added in actually our NHD Valley segments, um, which this is a data set we've had in house for years. Um, but something that DNR uh, Institute for Fisheries Research produced that actually speaks to the cold temperature gradients within our rivers. Um, so very interesting data set for you GIS geeks out there. Um, we also support a whole host of coastal programs. Um, so if you ever want information on environmental area locations, critical dune areas, high risk erosion areas, um, we include all that stuff in here as well. Um, we've actually recently added, as I spoke to earlier, the historic land cover maps from Michigan Natural Features Inventory. <laughs> Excuse me, very, very cool data set. 
uh, just to go back and look at, uh, you know, historic land cover and, and what Michigan looked like um, before we, you know, got here, essentially. Um, so very cool to have that now included. Um, just going down the list here, we've now added beyond just the hydric soils, um, the full Sergo soil data set for the state. Um, so we'd had a lot of questions over the years about, you know, why do we only have wetland soils? Um, and this is a, a really cool layer that we can actually query and get back, you know, all the soil type information that's built into that Sergo soil database. Um, and I'll demo that functionality here in just a second. Um, wetland monitoring data now in here from uh, all of our EPA and state wetland monitoring efforts, um, showing you areas where we've actually done monitoring. Um, there's a whole uh, tool that can, is being built alongside this um, to give us some more information um, on each of those monitoring sites um, that's in development. So trying to include those areas as well. And just to wrap it up, we've also included um, some new land cover data. Uh, this layer has been a bit of a bear in terms of functionality, so we're still troubleshooting that one, but bear with us. Um, but again, useful data set to just sort of have in here, um, as well as our conservation recreations lands data, all of our mitigation watershed, uh, eco region, conservation easements, all that stuff has been in here for years. So lots and lots of data. Uh, I'm not going to get too far into the functional tools, but um, you know, just know that all of our landscape level wetland functional assessment data is also accessible through this uh, tool as well. Um, so one of the coolest things, I guess, about this is that for pretty much anywhere in the state, um, you can go in and just with a click get a pretty good idea of what sort of hydrologic resources are around you. Um, so if I just click anywhere in the map here, you can see on the left, we'll get um, a whole host of information on geography, uh, the lat lawn that I clicked on watershed information um, and this is one of the new additions you can actually see soil type at that point um, and go through here and see a whole host of, of data on that soil um, so this is something that had been requested for a long time and um, i think is very useful for our wetland scientists and beyond um, so just so you know that's there um, also one of the cooler things that we've developed in this over the years is the ability to take a point um, and then essentially highlight the different levels of watershed um, that encompass that point. So we're in the Maple watershed in this particular um, Huck H. I can go down to Stony Creek and then all the way down to Kleckner and Fuller Creek, um, the, the sub basin Huck 12 watershed. Um, and the other thing that we've sort of linked into this now is if you want to see the wetland the status and trends data um, and the actual report for each of these uh, basins, you can just click view here and it will take you over to our status and trends tool and quickly generate um, some wetland loss information for you. So you can see we have existing wetland acres in that watershed compared to historic wetland acres with uh, quite a heavy loss um, in that particular watershed. So you can do that for any place in the state. Um, all of that data is statewide. And um, that tool has uh, become very useful for us even in the, the regulatory program. So just one of the many things you can do in WMV. Um, quickly, just to show some of the new buffer tools we've included, um, you can now buffer the NHD streams as well as NWI. Um, so if you check this box here in the buffer tool, it will actually turn the layer on if you haven't done it already. You can quickly punch in a buffer into the box and go click an NWI wetland, and it will throw a neat 500-foot buffer around that entire polygon. So again, one of the things that had been requested over the years was that we had that functionality loaded for NHD. So same thing, if NHD isn't on, and actually I'm gonna go ahead and throw up an aerial here just to make this easier to see. Go back to our tools. There we go. So NHD now being on, I can actually do the same exact functionality 
with that stream segment that we've always been able to do with our wetland buffering. Um, so again, useful for you know a number of things, uh, quick regulatory calls being one of them for our staff, um, but some new functionality that's just recently been added. Um, obviously our basic measuring tools are still in here. Um, you can zoom essentially to any geography that you like. Um, and you can also create maps and actually export PDFs um, and email links out of here if you wanted to share this um, in your consultancy or with your staff and beyond. Um, you can actually export some of our GIS data from here, including our uh, part 303 state wetland inventory, which we get a lot of requests for. Um, the cool thing that's been built into here is you can actually now come in and pick just a county to download directly from WMV. Um, so it makes it a quick, easy zip file and, and puts it right on your PC. Um, there's also things in here for NWI, the potential wetland restoration data, um, and several other of our WLSU based data sets here. So that's one way to access our data is through WMV. Um, for you GIS geeks out there, um, the latest and greatest thing is our Eagle Open Data Portal. And um, this is, you know, years in coming together. We've always had a lot of GIS data at Eagle, um, but it's always been very siloed. And we now have a whole Eagle GIS group that's come in and helped us organize um, and publish out our data in one source. Um, so for all of our authoritative data, essentially everything in here, um, you know, it, it has been available, just not as uh, accessible. So all of our data, specifically the wetlands data is in here. Um, you can see popular applications. We still are very popular between my Enviro and Wetlands Map Viewer. Um, and if you scroll all the way down to the bottom here, beyond the story maps, all kinds of cool stuff. Um, you can actually go into the different categories of data downloads. And, you know, somewhere on that list out of, you know, at least 118 data sets, um, most of which are coming from Water Resources Division. You can find things like our Part 303 State Wetland Inventory, uh, Myris Wetland Classes, Hydric Soils. I mean, it's, it's a ton of data, um, and it's now quickly uh, and easily accessible for download for anybody that wants to use this stuff in GIS. Um, there's also some map services for State of Michigan employees where this stuff can be pulled directly into Esri products. Um, and some functionality even to the public to do that. So um, very cool new development in terms of uh, Eagle GIS. So I think with that, I'm going to stop and um, just see if there's any remaining questions in our last 10 minutes or so. Thanks, Chad. Awesome. OK, so we have a few um more questions and so i think i know the, the answer to this one but um can we download data from an area we've zoomed into for example can i zoom into a specific environmental area and download just that shape file yes uh the environmental area data potentially um i'd have to go back and look it depends <laughs> it, it, it depends i'm not sure the environmental area data is available for download through wetlands map viewer um, but those boundaries should be available uh, through the open data portal. Um, so again, you can quickly just go in and grab the statewide uh, data set and clip out whatever you know individual feature you're looking for. Okay. Um, this person says, I've had trouble exporting the wetland inventory data, the Michigan wetland inventory data in a shape file format. I don't think I was ever successful. Is this a known issue? Yeah, the biggest issue with that data set is just its size. So it's, a, think, yeah. it's a six gigabyte download um, to do it statewide. Um, we've had a lot of updating and server issues in the background going on over the last year. We've been switching things around um, over to new Eagle GIS servers. So I'm hoping most of that functionality is working now, but certainly if it's not, um, you can click the contact link right on WMB and report it to us and we'll make sure we get it fired back up for you. Um, so hopefully that county export is working. I was, you know, hoping that people didn't have to download a six gig file every time they needed that. So, okay. Um, will there be new aerial imagery added to Wetlands Map Viewer in the future? 
Yes, that's on the docket. I'm hoping for this year. Um, looking to get some funding available to do some um, imagery updates. Um, somebody had asked, and I don't think I covered it, the, the best available imagery is what's used for the high res link in WMB. Um, so it should always be the most up to date latest imagery for whatever county you're looking at. Um, the status um, map in terms of what year each uh, county was flown is available on CSS's website. Um, but one of the things we're looking to build in this year to WMB is the ability to see the actual date for the tile of imagery you're looking at. Um, so look for that hopefully coming down the road here. All right. Um, there's a couple sort of policy um, questions in here. One of them is, will we require delineations to use LIDAR? And I guess I have two answers for that. Um, one is we would like um, wetland professionals to use all the data that they can to make the best decisions that they can. But, you know, as far as the the rules for delineations we're going to be following the um, regional supplements and the Army Corps delineation manual so um, yes and no um, can you give uh, more information on how NWI plus wetlands current functional tool layers um, on the wetlands map viewer is made and used so. I have my answer, Chad. I want you to uh, chime in. I would say that is a whole nother presentation that we would love <laughs> to give. Um, we have given it a couple times, um, but we would, we would love to to do that again sometime. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a good answer. That is a, a big hefty topic. Um, but just so you know, that data is, can, is still being done um, and, and we're hoping to continually update that tool um, on WMB as, as things go forward. So. Okay, um, maybe we'll take one more and then I think we probably need to wrap up. Is um, daddy, data copyrighted or can we utilize lake hydrography info to create lake maps for plat, plat book sales? This is, a, this is a conservation district. I feel like maybe this one's a little out of our expertise, but I can read it again. Is data copyrighted or can we utilize lake hydrography info to create lake maps for plat book sales? That's a good question. Um, all of our data is in the public domain um, and not copyrighted. So, you know, it's, I'm not sure if that could be used commercially or not. So I think I'll defer on that question. Okay. Well, I think that's probably it. Um, Elise, do you want to do some wrap up? Yes, yeah, so thank you very much, Chad, uh, for this presentation. I learned a lot. Um, it's amazing all the um, updates that have occurred um, in this realm. And so I look forward to using some of these tools in the future. So uh, I see lots of applause and uh, we appreciate so much that you um, provided this presentation to us today. Thank and you. with that, Thanks. you're welcome. Uh, with that, I think I will um, wrap up the webinar and thank all 160 participants for joining us today. And um, keep an eye on your emails from Michigan Wetland Association uh, in the future for new and exciting uh, opportunities to learn and grow in your profession. Thank you everyone and have a good day.